we want to talk about not getting spooked with all the market volatility. And, and we have seen a lot, especially since the end of summer. And, you know, we're getting a lot of questions from clients, um, our advisors. I know we're talking with everybody and just understanding what's happening with the bond market right now, the stock market, and really, you know, what's the strategy moving forward. And, and Bob and I will read the tea leaves here and just give you our viewpoint. So having said that, um, let's get right into the charts. And Bob, I'll give you the floor here. Oh, uh, thanks, Ry. Um, this is the S&P 500 index from 1996 uh, through year to date, uh, through the end of the last quarter, which was September 30th. Uh, and you can see, you know, in the, in the 90s and the, in 2000, the market really didn't go anywhere. Uh, actually, it was a lost decade for the S&P. But since 2008, from when we started paying capital, you know, the market's been on a tear. Um, but the last couple of years have been very challenging because you had the market at an all-time high back in February of 2020. And then we had COVID hit. And I don't know if you all recall, but I do, because uh, I still have the uh, scars to prove it. Uh, we had a 35% decline, you know, in five weeks, um, which I remember a lot of the comments we did. It, we actually did one of these fireside chats at that time. And a lot of the questions were, you know, how could things ever possibly get better, right? How could the market ever go up? You know, things are so bad. Um, and, you know, what happened was the market turned on a dime and, and we had a, a, a terrific rally, not only recovered the highs, but made a new high uh, almost two years ago um, in January of 2022. And um, almost to the, you know, the start of last year, right? Day one, the market went into a decline uh, after having a pretty good year in 2022. And we saw, a you know, almost a 25% decline and it bottomed uh, this this time a year ago, you know, um, and, you know, the markets had a nice recovery up until July of this year, when suddenly we saw the longer term rates on the bond market kind of spike up, which has caused a correction. Now, you know, there's a different definitions that the newspapers and Wall, and Wall Street uses. A pullback is less than 10%. A correction is anything over 10%. And then a crash is 50%. Um, Ryan doesn't allow me to use that word, but, um, you know, we've had, we've had, had crashes, right? We had a crash in 2007 where the markets lost 50% of its value. But here's the interesting thing, you know, at COVID when the market dropped and you were all down 35% in your equity holdings, you know, for five weeks, you know, the, the Dow got down to 18,000, you know, we're at 33,000 today. Um, you know, the S and P you know, I got, um, you know, I don't know, it was down to like 2,100, right? We're at, we're at 42, 41 now. So it feels like it should be a lot worse, right? It's, um, you know, but what it shows you is that the market does go up over time. Volatility is short term. And the reason is, is because earnings, you know, keep growing. Um, now this graph, the one I want you to look at, it was on the left-hand side, is corporate earnings and, and earnings growth. And this is a chart that goes from 1988 to um, actually out till 2025. And you'll see that earnings have grown, you know, almost every year, you know, since 2008. And basically earnings are profits and they're the lifeblood of stocks. And, and this is why I find it so disconcerting when, you know, when I watch the news, when I talk to my friends, when I talk to my clients and I talk to, you know, anyone, it's like, Bob, how can the market be at 33,000 when things are so bad, right? Things are awful. We're based on earnings that have been reported so far year to date. And with the estimates for the rest of the year, which is, you know, that blue line. Um, if we hit those estimates either this year or next year, it'll be the largest source of earnings. It'll be the largest earnings in the history of the country. In other words, our companies are making more money now than ever since any of us have been investing, right? So we have corporate profits at an all-time record high. Now, you know, we're in this yeah, but environment. When you hear a pundit, I was listening to Joe Kernan this morning, real early, he was on about 6 a.m. And it's like, oh yeah, earnings estimates are going up for next year. Yeah, but they could go down. <laughs> All right, yeah, the, but the analysts, the actual analysts are doing the analysis are increasing their earnings estimates right now. So. As a result, we've been very bullish on the market um, and we're very patient investors.
But, you know, when you look at the short term volatility, you know, we just had a 10 percent correction. What changed? You know, earnings didn't change. The economy didn't change. You know, we did have interest rates go up, but nothing really changed. What changed was an emotional reaction to the market. And, you know, one of the reasons why I've been a successful investor and, and why we've been successful as paying capital is because we are patient investors, right? And during these volatile periods is when the holdings of financial assets go from the impatient to the patient. Yeah. And if you look at this chart here, uh, this is just year by year since 1980. Um, you can see the bars that are going north or above the, the line there. That's positive years in the market. And where the bars going south, they're negative years in the market. And first off, the thing you'll notice is markets go up more than they go down. <laughs> it's, the, it's not as often that you get a negative year in the stock market, um, even though whenever the market goes down, it always feels more painful and it feels more arduous. Uh, but secondly, you'll see here along the way, you'll see those little red dots along the way. That's a sell-off in any given year. Um, and if you go all the way to the right right hand side here, you can see like if you can kind of squint and see it, but negative eight percent. Uh, that's the that's the the correction that we saw. Actually, it's more like ten percent this year. Um, last year, obviously, we were down as much as twenty five percent at one point. Um, but the point is, you know, sell offs in the market are very very normal. And on average, you see about a 10% correction in the stock market every year. And that's pretty much what we just saw. Um, we saw the market peak out at the end of the summer. And then all of a sudden, since then, we've seen a pretty healthy sell-off. Uh, panic has ensued. Uh, but to Bob's point, I mean, this is really where being an unemotional investor is really critical because these downturns don't last that long. And you can see, bar none, over time, markets go up a lot more than they go down. Um. The other thing we'll talk about too is, and this is kind of playing into the earnings picture, is you've heard a lot of talk about recession. Um, Bob and I call it the waiting for Godot recession, you know, the greatest no-show of all time. Um, last year, all we could hear about those, those experts on Wall Street, we'll put that in quotes, were so sure. In fact, Bloomberg Economics predicted 100% we would be in a recession by now this year. And ironically, not only do we have a recession in this past quarter, um, we had explosive growth. In fact, growth for the third quarter, which just reported last week, was 4.9%. Uh, uh, now, to make that even crazier, the quote-unquote experts uh, at the beginning of the quarter thought we were going to have no growth for that quarter. Um, so not, more, not were they not, just not, not right at all. They were, so, they were so wrong. They weren't even in the right ballpark <laughs> in terms of you know, where their, their estimates were. Um, and you can see here, this line, it goes from left to right. This is from 2001 to 2023. This is the growth in GDP for our country, um, economic growth. And you can see here only, you know, you had the, the pandemic there where you had that big dip. That's where the economy got completely shut off. It's like someone you know, turned off a switch or Bob likes to talk about the neutron bomb and everything just stopped um, to a huge resumption in economic growth. And I'll just point to the right-hand side there. And if you look at what makes up growth in our country and that blue color there, which is like the biggest color, is the 68.1% consumption. What drives the US economy is people like to spend money in America. Um, and Bob and I have another saying is, never discount the American consumer. And that's the one thing this year that's just surprised every analyst out there and every economist is... Americans have been spending. In fact, if you look at GDP for the quarter, 50% of that was people spending money. Uh, we had a big retail sales number last month. If you look at consumer stocks, they're doing really well. So, you know, the one I'd say main uh, culprit uh, of what everyone's gotten wrong is people's ability to continue to spend. And Bob and I will talk about it. We, we think that trend is going to continue. I think this is uh, one statistic that blows my mind whenever I see it, but this is the U.S. household net worth uh, just recently calculated. It's at $174 trillion. Now, this is you know the collective uh, value of our homes, our deposits, our pension funds, our companies, our portfolios. Um, so U.S. household net worth is at an all-time record high uh, in spite of the fact you know, that we had one of the worst years in history uh, last year in a, in a balanced portfolio is because, you know, real estate values have gone up dramatically 
as well as, you know, as I showed you how the equity market and the financial markets have gone up, you know, over the last 20 years. But I remember right before, you know, we had the great financial crisis in 2007. And, you know, it was a, a time where you know, things were very uncertain. Um, and our household net worth back then, based on this graph, as you can see, was 85 trillion. And then we had the great financial crisis, the, you know, the big economic crash of our lifetime. And at the bottom, we were at 73 trillion. So since 2000, March of, you know, 2009, um, we've gone from 73 trillion in U.S. household net worth to 174 trillion. Now, half of that is owned by the baby boomers. So all my fellow, fellow boomers are on here. We own half. Um, it's just one of the reasons why the consumer has been so strong, because baby boomers are spending. They're, you know, they're retiring in droves. Um, you know, percentage of largest percentage of baby boomers are retired now. And uh, go back one second, right? And, you know, they're spending on, you know, on services. They're less traveling in this last year was amazing. I, I didn't talk to anyone that I, uh, everybody I talked to was traveling somewhere. Uh, they call it revenge travel. Um, people are eating out. And that's why there's such a huge uh, deficit of, of, of jobs, uh, job openings, right? There's the a deficit of workers. There's a big demand for workers and services and healthcare, um, largely because the boomers have made a decision. They've, they've got half the net worth and they're going to spend it or give it to their kids. I think in a lot of cases they're going to do both, but based on the numbers we're looking at, you know, spending is, is going to stay pretty consistent. And they're also beneficiaries of these rates going up as we all will be because our interest on our bonds will go up as our bonds come due and get reinvested and our dividends are being increased. So we're getting higher income uh, on just about every financial asset. So the, um, you know, so the picture is pretty good. Now the big, the big change and the, and the big fear and the big problem with this market this year has been in order to fight inflation, which was 9% gang, um, which is now down to 3.7, maybe 3.5% now. So Inflation has been moderating, but to fight that, our Federal Reserve, which by the way, I just want everybody to realize the Federal Reserve is a lagging indicator. It doesn't lead, right? It follows. Um, and they're often wrong. Matter of fact, they're almost always wrong. Um, you know, Chairman Powell said long before he started raising rates that in, you know inflation was transitory. Then he said, I'm not even thinking about, even thinking about raising interest rates. Um, I had a chuckle today when he was on and he said, I'm not even thinking about, even thinking about making rate cuts next year, you know, because they don't lead, they follow, but they've done a lot of damage, um, you know, to our portfolios and, and, and financials in general, because they had to fight inflation. And we've had, as you can see on this graph shows the federal reserves, federal funds rate, which is the only rate they control has spiked up dramatically from basically zero to five and a quarter to five and a half percent which is where we are now. That's 520 basis points, 500, five and a quarter percent increase, 12 increases in a row. They paused today, which was good news. Um, that's a second pause in you know two quarters. So basically the experts, a lot of people that I read, my own personal belief is they're done. You know, they're done raising rates, right? The um, recent rise in interest rates of the bond market have done the rest of the work for them. Now, this graph is important because the Federal Reserve does issue what they call a dot plot, right? It's their estimation of where rates are going to be, you know, going forward. Well, the market, you know, knows that the Federal Reserve is often wrong. So they uh, they come up with their own expectation. And the market expectation now is that rates have peaked and that rates will be coming down. So you've got uh, a pretty good indication that rates are going to decline from the Federal Reserve's perspective. Now, that's good news for all of us, because when you have interest rates go up, let's talk about stocks. Stocks get repriced, right? It's it's all math, right? If you have higher rates, earnings are lower, um, margins are lower, and uh, you know if prices are up, pretty much what I thought happened last year, why we had a negative year in the market is because we had a rolling recession, um, primarily because margins shrunk, right? The profit margins were, were lower, so the earnings gain was less. Um, so productivity now is going up and margins are expanding based on the research that, that we do. So we think that, uh, you know, number one stocks have been repriced for rates going down. So when rates going up, when rates go down, they're going to get repriced higher. The biggest impact is of course on bonds. You know, we just hit 16 year highs 
in interest rates. Well, when you have 16-year highs in interest rates, you have 16-year low prices in bonds. But there's an, an incredible thing that happens. And, you know, since I'm the old dog with gray hair and, and scar tissue on my stomach lining to prove it, I've been through more than one interest rate cycle. And what happens when the Federal Reserve peaks in their interest rate increases, when six-month treasury rates hit their peak, really good things happen in financial markets. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we got a chart to show you what to expect going forward. Well, let me just point something out. So, you know, I think some of the conventional wisdom right now is I can get 5% in my money market fund. You can see up here, we got a peak here about five, five and a half percent um, for the Federal Reserve rate. Um, but basically, if we know next year, there's a good chance that rates are going to go down. Um, in fact, the long term projection is two and a half percent. That means if you're sitting in a money market fund right now, or you have a treasury bond that's going to come and do in one year, you could be getting 3% on that next year, or maybe 2.5%. So, you know, Bob and I's philosophy is we want to win the war, not the battle. And I think a lot of people right now, investors think, well, I'm just going to hide out in cash. I'm getting this great rate. Meanwhile, we know with, you know, a lot of certainty that rates aren't going to be that good for that much longer. And for all of us here on this call that are either planning for retirement or retired now, that doesn't cut it for the long term if you have a temporary rate at 5%. Now, if we think rates are going down, um, what happens to bond prices, what happens to the stock market historically are very good things when the Fed stops raising interest rates. And if you look at this chart here uh, from left to right, when the Fed is finished, right, or, uh, excuse me, if the Fed is finished hiking interest rates, this is how different asset classes have done after peak interest rates are over. Um, and you can see here, this is the S&P 500 stocks. You've got high yield bonds in the turquoise blue and the darker blue is your, your Bloomberg aggregate bond portfolio and six month CDs, which would be your shorter term uh, CDs like a lot of people are locked into right now. And you can see almost every time uh, stocks go up. Uh, in fact, in 2018, they went up 31% after the Fed stopped raising interest rates. There's only one time in history where they didn't go up and the bond market rallied heavily every single time. If you just look across there, um, if you go back to the 80s, bonds went up like 27, 30%. The rally was huge. So, you know, I know right now, and we had all the questions about this. If you're sitting on losses in your bond portfolio, the reality of it is with the Fed probably being done raising interest rates, uh, as bonds are coming due, you know, the rally in the bond market based on history should be pretty big. Um, and same goes for stocks. For the most part, when rates go down, uh, stocks tend to have a magnificent rally afterwards. So really, when you start thinking about the future, and, and Bob and I always like to say, you want to skate where the puck uh, is going. I think that was from Bob's hockey career. Or wait a second, that was Wayne Gretzky. I was confu <laughs> confusing too. You have better hair than Wayne Gretzky, Bob. Thank um, you, Ryan. Is, is the place you don't want to be is sitting in cash or short-term CDs. Uh, you want to be in stocks. You want to be in bonds. And most likely here, uh, if the Fed is done, inflation is moderating. Um, you know, you look at it, Bob said we're at 9% inflation. We're, we're already down, uh, getting closer to 3%. You take out shelter costs, we're getting under 3%. Um, you know, we should see rates go down next year. That should be very good for stocks and bonds. Um, and if I go to the next chart here, uh, this is another thing to think about too. So the other argument I hear all the time is, well, you know, I get 5% on a 10 year treasury bond right now. That's great competition for stocks. And I would say, hold up a second. That's not true. First off, you know, we own bonds in your portfolio as a ballast, right? We know with bonds, you get an interest rate, you know, the money comes due. So when you lock into a, a, a 10 year bond, treasury, we'll say at 5%, every year you're just getting 5%. And one of the reasons we own stocks in your portfolio is because they pay out dividends. And dividends increase over time, right? That's an inflation hedge because the cash flow is increasing. And I just took one of the investments we own in our model portfolio for you, and that's the Vanguard Value Index. Back in 2010, the dividend was 2.6%. You know, it's a lot less than the 5% you can get on a treasury bond right now. But we have to remember is every year from 2010 up until last year, 2022, the dividends on that portfolio increased. In fact, there was only one year that dividends on that portfolio didn't go up. So the effective yield on your initial investment last year, if you would have bought that investment in 2010, was all the way up to 7.3% because the cash flow from dividends kept increasing every year. 
So that's what you want to think about too. With all the money we have in the market today, it's not the fact you're getting a two or 3% yield today. That's going to increase over time. So you're going to be getting like a six, 7% yield on those same investments, you know, come 10 years from now. And that's why you really can't compare that to getting a 5% uh, yield on a treasury bond, like right now, like a lot of people on TV like to compare the two. Um, so, you know, just think about that when you, when you're looking at your portfolio and you're getting those dividends, they're going to increase over time. That's going to be a huge inflation hedge for you as you move into retirement and you need to live on your portfolio. So one of the reasons why we follow maximum diversification is because we like to have uh, a lot of spare tires in our portfolio because not everything works at the same time. And the um, and we believe right now that we have a lot of asset classes out there that is historically are undervalued, right? We think, see them as the valuations are uh, lower than they've been in a number of years. So we don't think anything's really overvalued except for the meg mega tech uh, stocks, what they call the Magnificent Seven. Um, you know, so that's I think they're a little overowned. And uh, there's a little bit of bubble in those stocks, but you know we don't chase individual stocks. We don't buy individual stocks. We we diversify across all different asset classes. So, you know, with with the economy continuing to grow, and with profits actually accelerating based on the earnings estimates that we're looking at, um, we think that uh, you know our strategy is the right strategy. Maximum diversification is still the key. So, you know, I always love this quilt chart, and and you know I've loved it from the day I discovered it. And it shows basically from left to right, you have each annual year and it shows you each color box represents a different asset class. Um, many of which we own in your, in your portfolios, I own in mine. And there's never a colored box that stays at the top forever and never one that stays at the bottom. Um, you know, so there's winners and losers every year and uh, no one I've ever met is able to predict which ones are going to be the most successful and which are going to be least successful. What does work, however, is asset allocation. And as you can see by the black line in the middle in the white box, shows a balanced strategy, which we follow with all of your accounts. You know, we will have the big winners in our portfolio every year, we'll have the big losers, but over time we get good consistent performance. And that's really what it's about. And what I like about our portfolio right now with, I think rates uh, on the cusp of, of heading in, down is that, you know, our, as Ryan showed our dividend yields in our portfolio, we have increasing yielding portfolios, right? Where the dividends increased every year and you get more income, you know, from your original investment. And you're also going to, you know, we're getting good income from our bond portfolio, which of course the prices are going to start to revert uh, higher once, you know, rates start to come down. But the key is to have that balanced approach. And, you know, at times when something's out of favor, like real estate's out of favor right now, you know, you can invest in that at a 5% interest rate, right? In dividend rate. So you get 5% plus, you know, your, the ability to have your money grow. So it's, um, you know, we believe in in buying low and holding forever. Um, and so every day in our portfolio, you know, the market gives you opportunities. And, um, you know, as of today, our, the cash flow in our portfolio is at an all-time record high. And we expect that to continue because as earnings go up, dividends go up. And now that rates are higher, although it does knock the crap out of our bond prices, you know, what we've learned on bonds, guys, what we all know is that, you know, in time, all bonds come due, but it's not what you pay for a bond and it's not your original coupon that matters. What really matters is how much you reinvest your maturing principal and your income into. And right now we're at 16 year highs in bond yields. Um, quite frankly, I would love to see them go higher because that means we'd make more money in our bond portfolio over our lifetime. Emotionally, I would love them to go down to see the bond prices go up to make us all feel better. But we just had the worst three-year you know, bond market in, in our lifetime. Right? We've never seen interest rates go up. Um, I don't think that's going to continue. I don't think we're going to have another bad three years. So the, th the key is, is to you know, allow us to keep continuing reinvesting those interest payments back into the bond market at higher yields. And as every bond comes due, since we're at a 16 year high in interest rates, we're going to be re reinvesting at higher coupons, higher interest rates. So ultimately we'll make more money on the bond portfolio, not less. Um, yeah. So why don't we go to some questions? Um, we did get a lot of questions about the bond market and the stock market as well. No surprise. Um, and I'll paraphrase here a little bit, but 
you know, some questions about being heavily invested on the bond side. Uh, the bond market is scary. That's based on my sell price if I were to sell today, but it's still very scary, very Halloween appropriate. Uh, are we in the right strategy holding? Um, I'm 78. Do I have the time to recoup? So yeah, with bond prices down, I'll just mention that um, the way these portfolios work is a lot of money is going to come due over the next couple of years. In fact, uh, we use a term called duration. How long does it take to get your full principal back on your portfolio? Right now, it's about six years. So if you think about that every year between interest and principal coming back, that's that's about 16 to 17% of the portfolio that's going to keep coming back uh, every single year. And you have to remember too, if the bonds are selling at a 90 cents on the dollar or 85 cents on the dollar, they mature at a hundred cents on the dollar. And even if the manager sells a bond and they buy another bond, you know, at a discount as well, at some point there is a maturity date on all those bonds. So, you know, we think that we probably at peak, uh, I guess, monetary policy with Fed tightening, uh, they're, they're probably going to back off from here. So, you know, between money coming due that we can reinvest at a higher rate, and again, a good majority of your portfolio is going to come due over the next six, all your portfolio is going to come due over the next six years. Uh, and the fact that if rates do come down a little bit, the prices will start to appreciate again. We should see a big rally in those bond portfolios at some point. And we just showed you historically what happens when monetary policy um, you know, finally is at, at the peak, it, is bonds do really, really well. So we expect the same will happen this time around. Hey, Rob, I can just say one thing. I mean, when you're 78 years old, I appreciate that. Um, when I was a young buck starting it back in the seventies at Merrill Lynch and I called one of my clients to buy a 14 and a quarter percent zero coupon treasury bond. And he said, Bob, that's, that doesn't come due for 30 years. He said, I'll be dead when it, by the time it comes due. And he said, but you know, what do you really think about it? You don't want your money to expire before you do. So it's okay that you're not going to be around when every one of your bonds comes due, right? <laughs> if you can get a good interest rate, you want to grab it. Another question that came in is how concerned are you regarding the massive national debt and how it'll affect the stock market? How will you alter investment approach to address the above concern? Uh, well, first off, the deficit is definitely an issue, right? I'm $2 trillion <laughs> you know, was, the, was the deficit over the last uh, 12 months or so. Uh, and, it, and it's continuing to rise. Um, you know, the, the one thing you're getting to a point now with higher interest rates is it's really becoming unsustainable. Um, the interest cost as a, as a percentage of debt, it's getting out of hand. So you're, you're at a position now where you know, the government actually going to have their feet to the fire um, you know, with whether the dollar starts to weaken, um, you get to a point where interest rates stay high, they don't go down, inflation stays high. So from an investment perspective, and this is why you want to own stocks, number one, because one of the only real inflation hedges we have are stocks. We showed you how dividends go up over time. That protects you against inflation. And deficits are very inflationary. The other component to our portfolios is we have a very healthy international exposure. So, you know, if we do see a weak dollar, which at some point we probably will, because you know economic con conditions change, you know, we have money in a lot of different currencies that will offset uh, weakness in the U.S. dollar. So our money's not just all uh, housed here in the U.S. Those international positions you have have local currencies as well. So having that diversified portfolio is really one of your only defenses against the fact that we do have this large deficit. I'm and I think that chart was a good illustration of that rise. You showed like on value, how the dividend is increased every year. Um, and that's how equities are such a hedge against inflation because you see corporate earnings going up, which gives companies more money, you know, to, to reinvest and to distribute um, is why that's equities have historically always been the best hedge against inflation. And spending, as we all learned, um, is very inflationary. Very inflationary. Yes, we were, we're experiencing it right now. 9% um, inflation was real. Um, the other question coming in here is, looks like the powers that are, that be, excuse me, the powers that be are determined to wreck the markets. What is your take? Um, I think despite the powers that be, uh, I think what you see is resilience, right? I mean, we had... Our interest rate policy, we've seen interest rates get hiked over 500 basis points or over 5%. Um, we have a government that can't stop spending money. Uh, yet, through all of that, economic growth is still going up. Um, you know, Companies are very resourceful. Uh, people are very resourceful. So you know, I do think you still have gridlock in, uh, in government, which I think is a good thing. You don't want anyone's extreme policy. 
I, I, I think the deficit is a big issue, but I think overall, again, Bob and I's viewpoint is, you know, we're not going into recession. Um, inflation is coming down and the labor market is extremely tight. And we don't think that's going away because of demographics. So I think the powers that be, um, they're going to try to screw it up, but I think they're going to have, a, they're still going to have a hard time screwing up, um, you know, American business and, and Americans in general. We're, we're very, very uh, resourceful people. Well, for anybody who's a, a fan of these fireside chats, we, I hope you remember the one we did before the last election, uh, where we went through um, the administrations of all the prior presidents for the last 40, 50 years. And over every four-year term, GDP grew identically. The stock market returns were identical. Um, there was no difference whether it was a red or a blue uh, person sitting in the White House. So what we concluded was the market doesn't care you know, who's sitting in the White House as long as there's someone sitting there. And because what we found was the economy's performance and the market's performance were identical, uh, as hard as it is to believe. Yeah, exactly. So we always say, don't let your political affiliations get in the way of a good investment strategy. Um, so we, we try to be as, uh, I guess, uh, as unbiased uh, as possible when it comes to making decisions about your portfolio. Uh, the next question comes in is, if we were to see bank failures again, as predicted by some investment publications, is the best place to put cash in bonds or stocks right now? Well, our view is both. You know, Again, going back to the fact that we think we're at peak monetary policy or the terminal rate. Uh, we think rates will come down next year. That's going to be good for both the stock and the bond markets. And I think that credit facility that the Fed put in place after we saw a couple of big bank failures back in March did their job. Um, we really didn't see big cracks in the system after that. They actually did a good job. I would actually commend the Fed uh, for the backstop that they put in place. And for the most part, you're not seeing like extreme um, fleas. Uh, deposits aren't fleeing banks in droves. Like that was a big concern that's starting to, to moderate. So we're not that concerned about the banking system uh, from my viewpoint. But Bob, you know, please chime in there as well. Well, you know, one of the things that... Um... You know, if you all recall last year, we had 100% of economists predicting a recession. And a lot of it was based on the fact we had an inverted yield curve, right? It was so obvious as like every inverted yield curve has predicted a recession. Well, you know, didn't mean didn't mean the recession was going to come in six months. Some of them were predicted, they came three or four years later. So was it really predictive? Uh, obviously not. We're not in recession. But, you know, a lot of times when you have an inverted yield curve, it stays inverted until something breaks. And we did have three regional, large regional banks uh, that failed. Um, and so, you know, something did break. And as a result, you know, we don't have an inverted yield curve any longer. So, you know, does it have any predictive power? Maybe, um, you know, it, it it did break something. It broke the regional banks and those three regional banks. But, um, you know, based on all the recent stress tests that have been done um, and looking at the earnings and it, first quarter earnings from the largest banks were spectacular. Uh, you know, in spite of J.B. Diamond telling us everybody's a hurricane on the horizon, they came in record earnings. So, you know, I think that the banking system's in good shape. But again, we own 10,000, you know, we own a piece of 10,000 different companies in our diversified portfolio. Some of them are banks. Um, I hope they all go up. Bob, I love your optimism. Um, and then Tim just put a, a note in the chat here. I'll just reiterate this. He said, so to your point, if we purchase a 10-year treasury today at 5%, you should still realize you're 100% principal on that treasury, right? When it matures in 10 years, in the meantime, no matter what, you get your 5% interest. And that's exactly right. Um, you know, whereas you do get dividends every year on your equity portfolio, but they're not guaranteed. But as I just showed in that example, over the last 13 years, there's only one year that the dividends didn't go up. In fact, they were flat in a 13-year period. So it's very rare. Even last year with the markets down 20%, Dividend yields went up big because of inflation. And that's why inherently you want to have stocks in your portfolio because cost of living is going up um, and those dividends do increase. But we want the bonds in the portfolio for stability uh, over the long term as well. Um, because again, with the bonds, no matter what happens, and again, this goes back to, I know you've seen losses on your portfolio. Sometimes the manager will trade losses because the tide's down. They're jumping from one boat to another uh, while the tide's down because the economics on that bond might be better longer term. I saw that was another question in the chat here. Um, it's all been losses because the Fed's been just increasing interest rates. But again, remember, you'll have that effect, that seesaw effect, where um, you know it'll go the other way. Um, if, if rates start to moderate like we think they will, 
bond prices will start to come back. And as they mature, and again, remember, 100% of those portfolios are coming back to you over the next six years. So even though it looks like a lot of the bonds are out further, there's lots of principal and interest coming due um, over the course of the next couple of years. And we're going to start reinvesting at higher rates, which we haven't done in 16 years or 17 years. Uh, well, the other thing is, right? I think you have, I don't know, it's closing in on $6 trillion now in money market funds and, and short-term treasuries, CDs. Um, and, and once there is a change, right? Once you see uh, a change, a shift in interest rates, or at least the perception on the part of the investing markets that, uh, you know, rates are going to come down, that money's got to go somewhere. Um, and it's going to, you know, you, you could see a, a, what I call a rip your face off rally at some point, you know, when that money decides to move from sitting in cash, basically is what it is, um, you know, into financial assets. Um, and that's really what, what it comes down to when you're, when you we sit with a big part of your portfolio in a money market or a treasury, you're not investing, you're waiting to invest. So we basically have 6 trillion waiting, you know, to invest. Um, and I, what I've seen over my career is you're not going to get there before, you know, you miss the opportunity. So right now we see phenomenal opportunity in our portfolio. Um, we haven't seen new highs, you know, in a, almost two years. Um, but that's because the market only sits at new highs 5% of the time. But, you know, it's, it's about patience and we get paid to wait, right? But a, a good part of our portfolio return comes from dividends and interest. And there's appreciation, there's big spikes come, you know, out of nowhere, uh, just like we saw after the, you know, the COVID crisis, how quickly those markets recovered and how fast they went up. Uh, you know, you can be nimble, but you can't be quick. So we want to stay invested. Uh, we're very optimistic. And uh, we think the markets have, you know, gone through this period um, of this uncertainty, you know, really well. The economy's done extremely well uh, and in the face of all this uncertainty. Um, but, you know, there's volatility is caused by emotions. And, you know, st companies and stocks, they're, they're dispassionate. The market, you know, looks out three to, three to 30 months. Uh, it's already looking down the road and pricing in things that we don't even know about yet. It's, it's so it's, you know, I don't see any reason for anyone to panic. And quite frankly, we haven't had a lot of panic, um, but there's just so much negative press. We thought it'd be a good idea, you know, to get together with everybody and just, uh, you know, let them know that we see the glass glass is half full. And, um, you know, I, I think we're on the cusp of some really fantastic returns going forward. Yeah, and I don't want to jinx it, but anytime we do a fireside chat, it's usually when markets are at their worst and tends to be the best buying opportunity, but that's a total jinx. Um, <laughs> yeah, why, why don't we leave it there? That's uh, We went for a good 40 minutes and we kept all of your attention for 40 minutes, which maybe it's just Bob's so charming. I don't know, but uh, but we do appreciate everyone jumping on it. We apologize about yesterday. Um, and to Bob's point, I, this is one of my favorite Bobisms is markets don't settle down, they settle up. So we want to stick to our strategy. We want to stick to our knitting. We've, we've done it for, for decades now. Um, and we believe it'll continue to do what it's always done. And that's get us to our goals in the long term. So we appreciate everyone. Have a great evening. Um, we'll have this recorded so you can watch it later if, if you want to watch it again. Um, <laughs> and uh, you'll be talking to all your advisors and we'll be talking to you too. So thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.